Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this talk in the Great Decisions series. Our speaker today is Todd Lefko, and his topic is Global Chains and National Security. Todd Lefko is president of the International Business Development Company. He has international business and academic ties going back 30 years with special expertise in Russian affairs. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, Global Minnesota, and the Foreign Affairs Association. We are deeply grateful to all these organizations. Although we are now in March of 2022, this talk today still draws on the 2021 briefing book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks. Through the generosity of Global Minnesota, we have a number of briefing books available for checkout at the library. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Todd Lefko, on global supply chains and national security. Thank you. Judy, thank you very, very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I, I, I only wish that we were all sitting at the library in the community room. That would make life a lot simpler. In fact, one of the questions has been the, between myself and my friends, what does normal mean anymore? And that applies to, you know, to supply chains. Because when we're talking about supply chains, we're talking about the idea of something that goes from a concept to the idea of the shelf at Walmart. That was the way we used to think about it. How does something become produced? In reality, what I'm going to do is that is trying to explain the idea that it's more than just the products, it's concepts, ideas, and basically our, our, our whole process of information and the truth that's happening. What I'd like to do before I get into the, the PowerPoint, Grayson, why don't you take that off for a few minutes and then let's put it back on. Um, thanks. Um, I wanna spend about 15, 20 minutes introducing it because this is the supply chain concept reflects a number of factors that are happening in the world today. It's a context. And so the context of supplying things has changed over the last number of years and it reflects a number of other values, principles and, 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 and relationships that have not existed before in the world. And so what we're gonna talk about first is the idea of sort of a, for 15, 20 minutes as an overview. And then we'll go to the PowerPoint and some of the facts and the numbers that are there because the facts and numbers keep changing on a daily basis. The basic processes that are going on don't. And they're the same questions that have been before. Generally what happens though, is that we never paid attention to them. There's what's called um, the Overton window. And the idea is that some concepts are there such as power or how you relate with somebody, but until it becomes a factor in history that people notice, it doesn't have an impact upon the political supply line. I kid about the idea that one of my great frustrations with the, the founders of the constitution and the fathers of the constitution was that they didn't spend more time in internet, internet security. And at that point, nobody thought about it. Well. Things like pandemics and supply chains were there. They've been there forever. The question is whether people thought about it. And, and you tie that to what's called the Colling Ridge Dilemma. And the Colling Ridge Dilemma is the idea that when something is easy to do, um, when something's not noticed, but could be acted upon relatively cheaply and easily, nobody notices it. By the time it becomes a factor, it becomes extremely expensive and politically difficult to accomplish, such as pandemic vaccines or the idea of how to relate to warfare when people have not been in warfare for a long time. So let me begin with the 800 pound gorilla and then go to the monkeys. You know, how will war in Europe you know, affect the supply chains, whether we're at the pump or paying for bread or anything else? We have a number, you know, so the supply chains, which remain ignored, don't become ignored when they can no longer be ignored. But we've ignored many of these for years. And so we're seeing a shift. When Russia can provide roughly 40% of the gas that the EU uses or 25% of uh, roughly one third of the oil, you know, there's a shift in the chain 
that's having implications both geopolitically and the idea of, in terms of international gas lines. Russia is sending out roughly 5, billion, 5 million barrels per day in terms of oil. Three to four of those may be affected in the way it looks like it's going to be because of our control of the secondary markets uh, in terms of international trade. You can have the oil, but unless somebody buys it, it doesn't matter. And that's what the Russians are learning right now. Now, things like supply chains. How quickly can weapons be sent to the Ukraine? Who pays for them? The idea of access, because the, the Russians have taken over a good share of the access in. You know, the, Russia, the weapons may be able to get in. The question will be the timing on them. And that's a, that's a thing which is immediate for the Russians at the moment. There's a question about the impact of stoppage of trade with Russia. This is really a question of access to supply chains. A good share of the microchips that are coming in um, to Russia are basically coming from the West, a good share of the technologies there. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> it's my winter cold coming back. Um, yesterday, after 20 some years, my company basically either went out of business or paused because our company stopped shipping to Russia. That's assuming we could have gotten the ships, which we can't. Um, and because of supply chain you know, labor and things like that. So this becomes a personal issue for me, not just the question of something which is, which is theoretical. Um, you're seeing policy decisions by Apple, by most major corporations, okay, corporations in the world right now about do they stop? Because if you can't get access to the materials you need, and things, some things are fairly basic. Modern cars need roughly an average of 3,000 microchips. If you can't get the microchips, you can't produce the cars unless you're, body, unless you're doing an extremely older model. So the impact becomes not just on Russia, the impact becomes worldwide and, and it will hurt the average Russian. And, and part of the question here is, when you do restrictions on supply chain, whom do you affect? Do you affect, do you affect Putin, who's still going to eat well, or do you affect the average Russian, who basically is getting pressured, you know, more and more? There's a role now that, in terms of supply chain, we've shifted from products to a weaponization of finances. You had the Russians tried to set it up where they planned on the idea of trying to provide protection for themselves. So they set up a, a stabilization fund of roughly 630 to 642 billion dollars, which they thought would help them through. One of the guys the other day, one of the generals stood up in the Russian Security Council in front of Putin. He said, listen, and he was shaking at the time. He said, listen, he said, they, they tried to do sanctions against us when we invaded Georgia in 2008. They did it to us when we invaded Crimea, and he didn't use the word invaded, but he, but he said when we went into Crimea, he said, we will survive this. We have the funds. And what's happened is they're discovering they, they misjudge the West. They misjudge the reaction. You've got the one stabilization fund, which basically because of control by access of so many investments in the West, much of it will become useless to Russia. And one of our friends is, the, is very high up in the Russian Central Bank, and this has been a very tough week for her. And, um, and uh, you get all kinds of pressure from them because this is not what they expected. You also have a secondary stabilization fund of roughly $190 billion, which was based upon the price of oil and gas. And their estimate of the break-even point for Russia was $40 to $43 a barrel. At 116, the pig should be in clover. But there's the question of can they sell it? Because they're having limits on who will buy it because of the fear of secondary um, sanctions by the United States. So the question starts to be Russia misjudged. They thought they had control over access systems and supply chains. They don't. And so the question is not whether you have them, the question is what do you do with them? So we're seeing fights over the possible shifts away from dollars to baskets and the remnimity. Um, the Chinese and Russians are trying to find alternative methods because they've been trying for years to replace the dollars because oil and most products are basically based in dollars and uh, dollar enumerated funds. Right now, only 14% of the Russian investments are basically tied to the Russian, to the Chinese National Bank, which means 
that they've got tremendous exposure to the West, but basically, you know, the Chinese can't help them. And the question becomes whether the Chinese will, you know, at the point. You're seeing impacts here. Every day as you go to the pump in the United States, you're seeing a rise in fuel prices, a lot of which are basically just additional profits for the oil companies here. And you're seeing a rise in wheat and, and food prices. What we didn't think about was the impact. You've got over 30% of the world wheat exports are basically coming out of Russia and Ukraine together. You've got the fact that basically at this point, the idea that you're seeing a rise in food prices, you're seeing a number of countries that are already food dependent and in, in tough shape, dependent upon Ukrainian or Russian exports of wheat, grain, or barley, uh, for different forms of grain, such as wheat, rye, or barley. Right now, you're getting places like Egypt, which is the world's largest importer of, of wheat, in deep trouble trying to find other solutions. You're trying to find, you've got a number of countries that are dependent, such as in North Africa, on Ukrainian wheat. And it's not just wheat, you've got at least a minimum of 10% or more of the world's corn you know, coming out there. And so what you've got is a situation where the food chain across the world, in terms of pricing and access, because if you can't afford to buy it, and that example would be fertilizer, natural, <coughs> excuse me, natural gas is one of the major components of fertilizer. Now, what's happening is the price of natural gas is going up, the price of fertilizer is going up, and some of the nations that are gambling, like Turkey, basically can't afford it. You've got places like, like Neon, one half of the world's supply of Neon, which is used in chips you know, and computers, basically is coming out of Ukraine. And the question is, what happens to that kind of markets? So supply chains become tools and weapons both ways. At this moment, Russia is supplying um, to at least 10% of the world's copper. It's got a, a good share of the world's titanium that, that Boeing and other uses, Boeing and other companies use, the idea of parts of the rare earth, you know, and it's supplying a model for China in terms of supply chains of decisions, because the Chinese are figuring if the Russians can move in basically and take it over. The original plan of Russia was to move in and take over the country within one day. And it was one of those deals where you'd invade in the morning, Zelensky would, would escape the country by noon, you'd have a replacement for him by two o'clock and everybody would be back home you know, quickly and, and the West wouldn't act. And there's a number of other things we can get into in questions on that. But the assumption was if China saw that happening in Russia where the West did nothing, you'd see Taiwan next. And so what happens is the question of, do you, can you really do two or three parallel wars at one start uh, come up? So we start to get questions of banking, finance, uh, geopolitics, finance, products, power, food, hunger, the shifting of populations. You've had the largest um, migration of people seeking to leave a country um, in, a, in a short period since World War II close to between one and two million and closer to two million probably have already left the country and are trying to get out. And then you get questions like in Russia where people are trying to get to the border so they get out before Putin declares you know, martial law and basically blocks anybody from leaving the country no matter how much money you've got. The access to long-term access to nutrients, which in Africa is a major issue because a lot of people there are, you know, are not getting early childhood um, treatment of food and the nutrients that they need. You know, we're watching a fight now over a redefinition of what power and what civilization authority is in the world. So let me run through a couple more questions then we're gonna run through the, the PowerPoint. So we're seeing a change in international trade, a questioning of the old neoliberal policies, markets, you know, and institutions from the, uh, from the things that were set up that we controlled and this was brilliant when we set it up after World War II in terms of the international, um, in terms of the World Trade Organization, which was General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, the IMF, the UN, all of these were set up with us basically control. And it was like a triangular relationship where we were at the top. And this was a brilliant system as long as we controlled it. We don't to the same degree anymore. 
And it's really frustrating to us because we don't know how to control and make the world do what we want to do in at this point. So there's an issue right here of free trade versus protectionism with every, uh, every country trying to do supply chain nationalism to protect their own markets. We're seeing this whole concept of what was called the Beijing versus Washington consensus, where basically the question starts to be, what's the role of the function relative to the free market? And we don't have a clear market, you know, clear decision on this. The question of democracy, for a lot of young people, they're sitting there around the world saying democracy, and they're looking at Washington as the model saying, you know, democracy is not a very efficient system. It's not as fast as you see in China or, or, or Russia. And they're correct. Democracy was not set up to be a simple system or efficiency. It was set up to be participatory. And for a lot of young people, they don't understand because they don't remember communism or the idea of fascism or the idea of, of other systems that challenge the way that we grew up. You know, we're seeing questions of what the impacts of sanctions are going to be. Remember, as I mentioned, it works both ways. Smoot Hawley in 1930 basically damaged us also. You know, we wanted to hurt other nations that ended up hurting us. So we're seeing a questioning of what's the proper role of the United States at what you're seeing in Ukraine and across the world now as the major defender of capitalism and democracy. You know, Sam Huntington talks about the idea of the clash of civilizations and the, con the concept of a Thucydides trap where a challenging nation such as China or Russia always goes to war with those nations that they, they see as superior to them, you know, at that point, and that Graham Mallison talks about in terms of Thucydides. And the question becomes, is this part of a normal process? And there are all these societies, that, and many people in China have this view that the East is rising and the West is declining. The United States is a spent force, which is part of Putin's thinking, a part of Xi Jinping's thinking, you know, at this moment. Third, is the question about what's the relationship here between short and long-term thinking in terms of supply chains and what do you need? Um, we're sitting there and the Chinese now are doing plans based upon a hundred year process where they're doing investments in nine areas of the economy in terms of computers and information systems and the idea of health and things like that that they believe are the long run control in batteries, things like that, that are the long run future of the control of world economy. We're sitting there and we're worried about profits for the next 90 days. And so, you know, when, when Kenny and others talk about the idea of short-term versus long-term thinking, are we doing things, you know, basically our long-term? Right now, in terms of things like solar panels, you know, the Germans have done a, an investment process in terms of taxation where you've got a, a minimum of an eight to 10 year where a law is basically locked in. So people can determine a return on investment. Right now, most of the world expects that, that Biden and the policies are there for four years and then a return to Trump or a Trump-like figure will come. And so nothing's gonna last forever. There's no future belief in the future uh, in terms of the ideas of stable U.S. as a stable force right now across the world. And so, and you think about the idea of that the 1940s with the Marshall Plan. First case in history where the country that was the winner invested a lot of money to rebuild the countries that just tried to kill it. That's long-term thinking because we realize, you know, right now we're in a situation where we're 4.5% of the world's population and we're depending upon 95.5% of the world to buy our products. And if they can't afford us or they have alternatives, then all of a sudden we get hit. And so the question becomes that's raised by Ukraine and raised by things like pandemics. How do we think of long range th you know, thoughts the question of pandemics was always there. We had the, we had the flu of, as example, the Spanish flu in 1918, where 19.5 million people died. You know, we had SARS in 2003, we had Hemi flu in 2014, we had Zika. You know, so the concept of international pandemics was not a surprise, but we cut our investments. 
And we tried to go to just in time processes in hospitals and production and things when we could have been focusing research in other areas, which now we're thinking about, you know, because we had shortages of beds and a number of other things. And we did, we had the possibility. This were not surprises. It's a question of how do you think about possibilities and where do you put investments, you know, within, within a society. We're trying to figure out what does it mean to have economic betterment and improvement? Um, we don't even know how to measure most things. Uh, when a, when a, a phone, a cell phone is made for 214 bucks, say in China, and you're seeing 33% of the companies now trying to figure out how to get out of, American companies trying to figure out how to get out of China for parts of their investments in either resource or go in Southeast Asia or going to Mexico or someplace, but getting out, shifting away from Mexico. But when you list imports in the country, the 214 bucks is list, listed as a cost to the United States, when in reality, the Chinese portion is basically assembling for eight to 14 bucks. So we don't really know how to measure the idea even of international trade. So a lot of the figures you see, frankly, don't reflect where the thought patterns or whether the creativity comes from, or whether the products come from, you know, and, and we don't even know how to measure that. And we don't even know what that means relative to the idea of newer indices, such as, you know, things, things you're seeing out of Bhutan in terms of the idea of happiness indices, or is, does this make your life better? We're starting to see a challenge to capitalism here across the world that supply chains basically supply. The fact is, I mean, things like, Vaccine costs basically four bucks, you know, for two dose course. You could have a global supply a surplus by 2014. Britain has ordered more than nine doses for each adult. Canada is more than 13. The wealthy will have surplus. The issue of sharing and vaccine diplomacy has become an evident issue. And the question is, for a lot of countries in the world, they're looking at a couple of years from now. You know, they're not worried about the idea of booster shots. They're worried about, can you get it at all? Because the supply chain in terms of money and distribution and the ability to buy doesn't exist for them. They just don't have the money, you know? And so the question of things like with, with climate change, what do you do about most of the, uh, the Asian island nations that are gonna be covered? You know, we don't think ahead and we haven't been able to do that. So in terms of capitalism, the role of capital versus labor, the role of Wall Street relative to Main Street. There's an old story that goes, it's sort of like one of those myths. Once upon a time, there was a country that was very, very rich at the national level, but very poor at the local level. Unfortunately, everyone lived at the local level. And so what you start to see is that we've, we've developed a system where the, when you see figures about how well the country's doing, it doesn't reflect what all of us are doing. The fact that Elon Musk can make or lose $80 billion in a day doesn't affect most of us because we're not in that kind of category. And so the questions of inequality start to raise and they start to become impacts upon, upon the rest of society and upon our politics. Okay, so we're seeing a challenge here, the, the question of, how do you basically provide growth? Do you need growth for basically everything for a better society? Is there a value in terms of relationships which go beyond growth? Is there something in terms of when, when there aren't enough jobs? If Boston if Boston's, um, consulting is correct and 40% of jobs, basically, especially in middle management are gonna be gone in the next number of years. And we base our judgments of others and our own value based upon what we do and there are no jobs. What do we do? That totally changes the supply chain in terms of both income, status, and a declaration of our own self-worth. You know, we built a society based often upon Ricardo's theory of competitive like, merit of advantage, where it all balanced out over the world. What we're watching, though, in the current pattern is the idea of a, of a changeover in terms of the idea of supply chains from a worldwide globalization process to one where China's developing its own tied to Russia, you're seeing the EU developing one and the US developing one. And we're seeing that especially in the idea of information systems. And the question is, if that continues, you get almost like an Orwell's 1984, where the different nations are fighting with each other 
And you're going to have all these other nations associate with different groupings based upon what their own national needs are. But you're seeing a breakdown in what we had developed after World War II as a system of globalization, which made us inter interdependent. And the reality is that we have become interdependent, whether we like it or not. I used to send my students to Target to find all the products that were made in the United States. The trip was relatively short because what happened was look at labels, you know, and there are not a lot of labels in terms of clothing or other products that was basically everything comes from the United States anymore. You know, I, I, mean, I love going to Byerly's and some of the places where they list the countries where the products come from, especially exotic fruits or something like that. And so you're watching this idea of fights over how do we protect state champions? You know, how do we get, <clears throat> how do we start to raise questions of the level of debt? Because right now debt is starting just in the initial phases to become an issue about <clears throat> what's our long-term investment as opposed to expenditure. All of those are issues in terms of where we choose to build and protect our supply chains you know, right now. We're watching this process right now. Of we're having a different changeover. We're having a changeover in terms of international architecture where you've got a Chinese bank for development. You know, the end of the Trans-Pacific um, project, which was, um, which was supposed to be the American method of blocking China off but which we decided was too political. And so everybody chickened out in the United States and, and allowed China to create their own Pacific control system now that we're trying to get back into and figure out what to do. We, we had no long-term concept of what the consequences were because every action has a secondary and tertiary impact, which we didn't understand. You know, and so we're watching the idea of the role of um, the Silk Road, the one belt, one road, where China's trying to build a structure over the next number of years that will provide the basis for access across the world, where a lot of you know, and a lot of people there, what they're trying to do is replace us, and they have in a number of markets as the major relationship that's there. We're starting to see fights over what does it mean to have an infrastructure to build not just supply chains, but what do you need in a society? We've understood it with physical and the idea of roads and bridges and sewers and things like that to some degree, though very slowly. And it's gonna take us years to go back to where the standards should be. But we also need infrastructure in terms of finance, transportation, energy, education, retraining. You're watching all of these ships coming in from Asia that now have to spend up to seven days on the average for the last few months waiting at LA or, um, or Long Beach, basically to get their stuff unloaded. And even then there was a shortage of trucks. There was a blockage in terms of getting out, you know? And so this was used to be 4.9 days and now it's seven, which means it's a slowing down in the process. We have trouble with our shipments because if you're sitting there and sending something um, into a place with a lot of shipments such as, such as London or Rotterdam, that's fairly simple because then you can replace it and add things to bring back. If you're sending it to Moscow or Kiev, which we do at least until this week um, passed, um, there aren't shipments coming back. So the containers sit there. So there become a shortage of containers you know, within the supply chain. See, the infrastructure becomes your monetary policy, your education and retraining, your role of the Federal Reserve and central banks, you know, the kind of inflationary rate that you've got. Russia just went from a 9.8 to 20% um, interest rate on bank loans. Our partners took 20% and then we're uh, a loan for 20% to pay for their next shipment. And then we're told that the United States wasn't gonna ship it. So they're trying to figure out how to get out of that at the moment. The role and strength of the challenges of the, uh, challenges of the dollar, the military, the defense policy. Joe Nye talks about every society has both hard and soft power. The hard power is the power of your economy and the military. The soft power is the image you have by others you know, in the world. And one of the frustrating things that happens for those of us that both live abroad and, and work abroad is the fact that people have this sort of schizophrenia now about the United States. 
they're sometimes mad after Afghanistan and Vietnam and Iraq and some of the other activities about is the United States really living up to its democratic standards, the things that we declare to be special. And they question us and they feel that we've had hubris and, and they sort of want us to be taught a lesson. And on the other hand, they want us to be successful. They want some place in the world that actually can be a model to them. You know, and, and they, they want something, it's like the idea of having heaven in a religion. You want some place to show that you can actually go to a spot and your life can be better. You can have a better life for your children and you can become successful, however you define it. And so they want the United States to be successful. And we're, they're angry at us because we're not being as successful as they wanted us to be. And it's frustrating for both for us and, and for others. And so we start to get questions then about our own governance, the idea of the quality of things, so the question of cybersecurity, because we've shifted from this process where now we become so dependent, we've basically centralized all most of our control systems where the internet um, basically becomes the process for finance, for trade, for most of our relationships, for communications, for banking, for everything like that. So that becomes centralized, while at the same time, you're decentralizing access. A kid standing in central Russia can have access, uh, or a group through like things so solar winds, where you can block off more than 20,000 companies in terms of their access to their own systems. A kid in Siberia can do that, or some nut can stand in a, in a cave in Pakistan and basically plot the attack on 9-11. One guy standing in a cave on his cell phone, that's access. So the nature of cyber relationships have changed in terms of control and management systems that are there. So we start to get questions on things, not just like intellectual property and retirement and pension and what it means, healthcare policies, you know, which all interrelate, the idea of demographic levels, you know, things like patent laws, if you can copy things very quickly. You know, um, we have all of these issues that frankly, we don't discuss and we haven't discussed. And it's really frustrating because elections in the United States were supposed to be the process by which we discuss deeper issues. And we're not, we become a bumper sticker society. You know, there's an old saying that goes, for every serious issue, there's always a simple answer which is always wrong. And often, whether it's make America great again, or the idea about, you know, my country right or wrong, or whatever you want to call it, we don't have a process that's really deep, you know, for the idea of discussing the kinds we're talking about today, and that most of us live through, you know, in that point. Um, Grayson, let's hit the, um, uh, the slideshow. Okay, now, Okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> what we hope for now, what is security exactly? You know, it's the idea theoretically, for years we thought it was limited to the idea, would somebody attack us? But we knew that nobody could ever attack us until 9-11. And so we never thought about it in that light. But the idea, uh, let's go to the next slide, um, please. Okay. Um, the idea became when it became the issue of access to mass or things like people hoarding toilet paper, you know, and most of us never grew up with a concept that a society, that an American society would hoard toilet paper or God knows mass or anything else. Um, our concept of what security means has changed. Now, Carl Sagan is one of the great minds that, that we've had in the United States when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues, he foresaw pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance while the United States slid almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. When, when you've got one third of the society in the United States that question whether you should have shots or masks or questioning science, or questioning the idea about what an expert knows. I mean, um, Sagan was prescient, unfortunately. 
And we're living through this question about whom do we believe, who controls information, who tells us what the truth is, and how do we define the truth? And the truth is basically part of a supply chain of decision making. But if we don't know, especially with the growth of things like artificial intelligence, things like that, if we don't know what the truth is, then how do we make value judgments? I kid about the idea that we're building smart bombs, smart cities, but not smarter decision makers. And all of that becomes a factor in what we choose to invest in and what we choose to do. Next slide, please. Okay, so we celebrated the fact that we control the world. That was great. You know, we had, after World War II, we were the unit power, especially after the, uh, after 91 and the end of the Soviet Union. We had the manufacturing, the development, the universities, transportation, and basically the economy and military were a hard power. And we believed in international institutions as long as we controlled them. And the dollar basically was the unit of, of control, one of the methods of control. And then um, like Topsy, um, uh, the, 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 Talib, Nikola Talib, Talib talks about the idea of the black swan. And the black swan is the unexpected event. And as I mentioned, this shouldn't have been a surprise because we had a number of times, but nobody thought about it or everybody thought we were so good. There's a, there's a thing in, in psychology talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect where often the smart, the smartest people are the, the slowest to react because they believe they're so smart they control every structure and that they, they don't want to listen to anybody else outside of their own information. So we finally understood that we were not totally in control. And one of the functions of getting older is this sense about how much in your own life did you actually control or do you actually control at the moment? And it's a really frightening existential discussion. Um, because you're afraid you're going to come up with the answer, which is the truth, which was maybe we don't, didn't, and didn't control as much in our lives as we thought. Next slide, please, Grayson. So it wasn't just a shortage of masks or ventilators or gloves or gowns or genetic pharmaceutical drugs, uh, at least 80% of which we're getting from China, by the way. Um, it was rare earths. There are 17 rare earths, you know, lithium for batteries, supplies for American companies like car parts. If you're waiting, um, you're seeing a slowdown in some of the productions. My computer and my car died in one day. Um, so I go to Berkeley Acura and I get a car and they said, we, because of the shortage of microchips, we can't get it to you for one month. And that's our best. And then I go to Apple and I say, I'm going to buy a new, you know, a new computer. And usually the happy person goes into the back of the there at Ridgedale and they come out with a computer they said well because of the shortage of microchips we'll hopefully have it um, shipped to you within the next month to six weeks and so we never thought about that the idea of whether it's car parts or food basically all those things have become questions now where they were never questions the concept it's really interesting walking into Walmart and seeing places that are empty on shelves. And I grew up in a society where the problem was choosing which product, not the fact that like the old days in Russia, I've been in Russia 33 years. And a lot of times there were no products on shelves. You just got whatever was there that day, but that was never an American issue because we had access to whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. And that's changed. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, when we didn't control the entire supply, whether it was health or something like that, we figured we could still buy it. Now, then China and other countries in terms of rare earths or other products or pharmaceutical masks, pharmaceutical masks or something like that, began manipulating supply as a method of control. We were really upset that other people were doing it to us. And so what happened was there was not just simply a commercial vulnerability, which is there, which was tied to profit, but it was an issue of political control and advantage. Suddenly it wasn't just trade, it was national security and we didn't control all the factors. And that's frustrating to a society which is based upon the fact that basically we control our lives. I mean, from the time, <clears throat> from the time we're young, we're taught, um, as Americans, we're taught individual responsibility and the fact that we have control over our lives. 
and that we believe there's a relationship, you know, to that we control the future. And all of a sudden, when it doesn't work that way, it's scary as all dickens. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so what do you need for security? Whatever security means, I was, I'm in this group of people that meets that, that discuss national security. And, and I asked somebody, I said, they're mostly cyber people. And I said, um, is it possible to have security? There's this long pause and the person looked back and said, no, because you get what's called a red queen effect. And it's the idea that you do something and somebody else builds the relationship and reacts to you and builds something to control what you've done. Then you build something to react to what they've done and you keep ratcheting up. So you need control over information, materials, resources, trained personnel, infrastructure. That's both physical and social, things like education, finance, educational systems, institutional governments, governance, uh, decision makers on military and cyber use, you know, technological capabilities, distributional systems on vaccines and food and materials. You know, <clears throat> we had them, but they weren't shipped very quickly. Agricultural system, because you've got to feed people. But if you don't have the fertilizer, you know, um, what happens? You know, you can pay, but you pay, but you basically have cut out a number of people from access to it, especially if they're being pressured by inflation and a number of other areas. Delivery systems like hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, things like my mother-in-law, who's 95 years old, and she's sitting there and the supply chain includes, do you have people that will come and take care of you in hospice? And the questions, it's interesting watching that we have all these things that are declared essential workers and non-essential workers. And usually the non-essential workers are the lowest paid. And yet they're the quote unquote lowest paid are the people that are actually delivering all the services to us and keeping everything going for most of the problems with pandemic, which may say something about our, our issues of value, medical supplies, teams, the kinds of burnout of doctors that you're seeing, that's supply chain. If you're getting a good share of the teachers, well, minimum of one third of the teachers that are trying to leave the educational system because they're basically burned out and so frustrated with pay and with process, what does that mean for an educational system for the United States if it's not your best and brightest? If you've got, if you've got people that are cutting out in terms of nurses and doctors, what does that mean for the delivery of healthcare, no matter how good it is? You know, the understanding of the threats and the competitors which require training. You know, the informational system to connect all the parts and the fact of the control over it, especially if somebody else seeks access to it, you know, through hacking. The legal system to ensure that some don't take advantage. The idiot, terrible human who should spend the rest of his life, who's charging thousands of dollars, who's now in prison, thank God, you know, for a pill that costs a couple bucks. And whether basically, you know, we're overpaying just for the, the, the sense, I mean, you know, what is the proper return on investment for a place like Pfizer or for some of the healthcare systems? You know, the really scary thing is that's challenged us and that we really haven't discussed is that the access to whatever we consider a value reflects the concept of who we are, a sense of community. There's a theory in social psychology talking about the idea that we define ourselves based upon our relationship with quote unquote, the other, and that we are not, we are not Jewish, we are not black, we are not Mexican, we are not Russian, we are not, and it goes on, we are not female, we are not gay, we are not Lutheran, you know, or which synod we are, we are not Catholic, that we define ourselves based upon whom we decide we are not. And what you're really doing is, is, is there a sense in the United States after the last couple of years with the growing inequality and other things of who we are clearly as a society? Right now, the rest of the world's asking, what's the proper function of the United States and who are you? And we're having some difficulty in making a decision. And I say this with sadness, because this is the, the, you don't appreciate how good the United States is until you go abroad sometimes. Um, and. I've been across the Atlantic 178 times and I kiss the ground every time I come back because I love the country. And, um, but you start watching this sense about, about we, a lot of people are questioning, do, do, does America understand who they are and who they should be? Next slide, please. 
Okay, so every product has a supply chain and they have sub-supply chains too. You know, your defense-related products, your semiconductors, computers, telecommunications, you know, railroad cars. Railroad cars for Washington, D.C. are made in China. And so when the Congress people take the Metro in to, to Congress to vote for things against China, they're riding, on, they're riding on Chinese cars. And that may be as symbolic as you can get. You know, for, so for national security, there are different factors. Let's keep going on this. Okay. We've had a relative deindustrialization de 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 of America over the past 30 years. We've shifted things around the world. We don't have the same control over every industrial product that we did 30, 40, 50 years ago relative to China and the world. We often depend upon others, you know, even in defense areas. Um, and the fights over Huawei, you know, and the idea of whether China was, China was basically going to uh, secretly control our governmental systems and have access to all of our information system. So we blocked them, you know, but a lot of countries are still using Huawei you know, and it still raises the same question that's there. We depend upon others in terms of both our civilian and our governmental purchases. And so it, this undermines our non-defense manufacturing sector's ability to innovate and develop new products and technology. And the question is, are we investing enough in R&D and the idea of, of research areas and the educational system whether through STEM or other programs to basically provide the alternatives for dependence upon others. Because as I mentioned, we have all these products where we're a car. And I asked somebody once, I said, is a Japanese car made in Tennessee with an engine from England and parts from both Canada and Mexico that ship back and forth for different treatments an American or a Japanese car? And the answer came back clearly, yes. You know, there was no answer because we become amalgams of a number of things. Keep going, please. Okay, so as China sells more products to us and we consume it, we become more vulnerable to espionage, economic and military sabotage and large scale data thefts or misuse, which is why a number of countries or companies are rethinking what kind of relationship do you have? Yeah, we brought them in to the World Trade Organization because we believed that if they were part of the system, they would play by all the rules. They didn't. And so the question starts to be, what do you do now? when they're not just copying, but they're developing on their own. So we have a number of policy options targeting our vulnerability against others. Next slide, please. So all we're talking about is the supply chain is the network between a company and suppliers to produce. And that can be information for, for um, CBS or NBC, um, the products, the process by which we produce a cell phone. I mean, think of what we've done. We've gone from the days where at 5.30 at night, we turned, on, we turned on Walter Cronkite or Howard K. Smith or Huntley and Brinkley because we knew that, especially Cronkite, we knew Cronkite was channeling God's word to us directly and was honest. He was the most trusted person in America, as were Huntley and Brinkley and Howard K. And you start watching the shift from that where you had gatekeepers and living numbers who checked all the facts to the idea now where, where with cell phones, we have 4 billion gatherers, producers and distributors and interpreters of news. And so right now, things like the process of supply chains is not just products and raw materials. Information is a raw material. You know, and you start getting processes that involve vendors, warehouses, transportation, distribution centers, retailers, product development, designers, marketing, operations, distribution, finance, customer service, labor, information systems, machinery, packaging, storage, pricing, competition, and governmental policies. That becomes all the elements of the supply chain. And it's difficult to have control because you get a process with things like, like periods of shortage. Um, Singapore had a shortage of eggs. So they overproduced eggs, at which point people had enough eggs 
And so they didn't buy them. So they were left with a glut and they destroyed 150,000 eggs. You know, right now we will provide enough vaccine eventually for the whole world. And then there will be an oversupply of it. And there is an oversupply of it in some places right now. But the question is, how do we basically do it so it's balanced and there's access and fairness within a system, you know, and it's done at a reasonable level. So we're talking, when you're talking about supply chains, you're talking about the level of technology, your manufacturing infrastructure, your educational levels, your systems, your access to natural resources. You know, we can do, China controls the 17 of most of the, the, the rare earths. We could have done it here, but we had we believed in the environmental laws also. We believed in some kind of protection. And what happened was China never allowed environmental destruction to become a factor. Watch the fights over we're having right now in northern Minnesota over the idea of nickel or other mines. And we need the resources, and yet we want to protect the environment. You know, and the question is, how do you balance that off? The question of financial capability, transportation capabilities, banking, financial systems, the ability of governments to govern. There's a theory across the world, which is shared across much of America that Washington has become dysfunctional. And I'll leave that to the questions because I can, I can go on on that for a longer period. You know, your cyber abilities, your shipping capabilities, your logistics. We have a shortage of 80,000 jobs in truck drivers right now. Eventually, when Elon Musk controls the world, um, there will be, you know, we'll be able to do much of the trucking without the drivers. But at the moment, we have a shortage of, of people who are willing to be long, long distance and other drivers. And so you've got to have people. If all the teachers cut out, <laughs> where are we going to get our teachers? Um, belief systems. What's the function of the private as opposed to public systems of investment in health or the kind of support that you should have? My daughter, who's a professor in, um, in Berlin at Humboldt University, the Germans have built up all kinds of support systems. The taxes are higher, but you get a re solid return on investment in terms of support for families and for healthcare. You know, it may not be as fast sometimes, but, there, but it is there and it does take care of you. You know, and that's a big question of belief system. You know, what... What basically, what basically do we do or don't we do? The role of nationalism, the distrust of foreigners. Right now, our visa system is cutting all these people who have been researchers out of the country because we're suspicious of other people. And so we, and for years, much of our new technologies came from immigrants to the United States. Right now that's changing because we, people can't get in. And so the policies that we do with visas in terms of outsiders and who are we welcoming to? You know, the question of our, our research and development capabilities, you know, the leadership that we have both in Washington and locally, your legal structure, distributional, the tax policies, how long do we support something, the military support that we, we have. Next slide, please. All those are factors. This is a complex relationship right now. China is satisfying roughly 90% of US antibiotics, vitamin C and ibuprofen, 70% of adacetum, uh, I can never pronounce that, Tylenol, it's much easier, 40 to 50% of heparin, 55% of global products are coming from China, which is going to be reduced greatly. Uh, questions of fluoride for Teflon is being supplied. China now controls 80% of the global supply of the 17 rare earths. The US F-35 jet requires 417 kilograms of rare materials. Now, what if the Chinese decide to cut us off? If we're in a conflict, military conflict over Taiwan and they cut us off, what do we do? The rare earths are used for smartphones, electric vehicles, wind turbines, and electric power system. We have no refining system in this country for rare earths. We decided just to ship it abroad, you know, and. Um, because their supply chain allowed a higher pollution tolerance. Now, you've got molybdenum from China controlling one-tenth of the world. Uh, they, uh, they control one, which is the firm there, controls one-tenth of the world, world cobalt. China did 70% of all soda photovoltaics panels, half of the world's electric vehicles, and a third of the world wind power. 
They're the largest battery, and I misspelled that, battery producer. And what we did is we got out of batteries years ago, and now we're trying to figure out how to get back in. And they control many of the raw materials for the clean tech uh, chain, such as cobalt, rare earths, and polysilicone, and a key ingredient in solar panels. You know, right now, the question of uh, whether it's um, ruthenium or other metals are basically done somewhere else. Um, uh, you've got um, palladium, 41% of the world's palladium coming out, you know, uh, that we need coming out of Russia, 40% of South Africa. Next, next slide, please. Now, this has a cost. The Chinese are the largest emitters of greenhouse gases and heavily dependent on coal, which supplies 58% of their electricity, which they're still continuing. And they're using as a weapon because they basically had, a, got a, had received a lot of it from Australia. But Australia criticized China on one policy, whereupon the Chinese cut out the Australians as a source. So, But they've got to get it from somewhere. And so they are buying it. Well, the Chinese are the leaders now in, in Amperex and batteries. They're doing one third of the world's market now on batteries are basically the contracts with Daimler, BMW and Tesla. The Chinese are dominating supply chains from the mines in Congo to the final production of lithium iron batteries. Their companies control 85% of the world's refined cobalt chemical capacity, which is the basis for most lithium iron. Their Chinese mines are do, doing most of the rare, rare earth materials for electric motors and wind turbines, you know, the lithium. Now, the cost has gone down. The question is access. So you've basically, the technology has helped change it, but you still need it. Uh, next slide, please. So local issues. I mentioned twin metals up in northern Minnesota. 88% um, of the cobalt, 75% of the platinum group, and 34% of the cotton reserves um, would, that we need are basically could come from that mine. And they're key for national economic security and central to low carbon future. But the question becomes, and I don't know how to solve this. I, if you want, I would love to have a brilliant answer on this, how to do a balance with the environmental issues. Because if you destroy something for the next um, thousands of years, you know, we're not going to wait for it to get better. And so what's the best choice? And that's a serious question for us. The world's top lithium mines now are in Australia, China, or Chile, and Argentina. We've got one lithium mine in Nevada. There's a coming shortage of concrete. Who would ever thought we'd run out of concrete? Um, but there's one major source left in California. And as we urbanize across the world, which shows you secondary and tertiary impacts, world shifts more to a need for concrete, which creates heat, heat, heat um, areas, um, which warms the area around it, which helps contribute to climate change and climate warming. So the issue of large plastic bags, there was a shortage of large plastic bags that we needed to produce um, our nanoparticles and the lipids and the things that we needed for vaccines. Um, there was an issue of getting the right kinds of syringes so we could get five doses as opposed to four. Now, the Chinese have done this concept of a military civilian fusion where you have a transfer of knowledge between sectors. We basically have done this where we often separate military and technology, except in some areas like DARPA, um, which allowed a lot of things from the military eventually to go into, into a civilian use. And we're... <coughs> There's a discussion now of trying to do the same thing with health that we've done with DARPA. And so we've built two supply chains which have some interrelationship but are parallel of defense and consumers. So that brings up the role of what should be the US manufacturing and national industrial policy. Should the government pick out certain companies that become the heroes and become the selected few for doing, from getting governmental money, almost like in China. Is this the best policy? We've had this theory, if you'll excuse the Chinese concept of letting a thousand flowers bloom, of having a number of small companies doing research bubbling up from the bottom. And, you know, and that's been fairly effective for us in the past, but it's a slow system. 
and it often doesn't interrelate in terms of what the needs are because everybody's in competition with each other. Is there a way to do this differently and still allow the idea of a full competitive process that's here? Next slide, please. Okay, so what we're seeing is that we had build up concepts of globalization, which provided the basis for the supply chains across the world, which, which have produced low cost production and shipping, a free flow of goods. And it was the idea, um, we had both inter interdependence um, because we were tied to the, the rest of the world as opposed to pure independence. There, there has not been pure independence from the rest of the world. Um, and, and you're trying to avoid the idea of dependence. Now, how do you do that? And which brings up the question now of how do you provide as many systems internally as possible so that you basically can do the questions and solve it so that you're not dependent upon the Chinese or other nations that basically do it. So you get this process now of economic nationalism and it becomes dangerous because other nations are doing the same thing at a time. How do we think of ourselves as part of a larger whole and how do we build a structure that basically allows us to do this? Um, there are some nations that will always be dependent no matter what. And what you're seeing is, is that we're starting to question um, what do we, let me do one more slide and let's open it up for, for uh, questions. I'm going on a little longer than I want to. Let's do, okay. So what's American? Often the design, the marketing, finance, and national security is both a concept and a reality. Um, Briscoe, one decade ago, the cognitions of national security bodies were largely con con concerned with two issues, nuclear proliferation and terrorism. Now there's a broad range of environmental issues which constitute a third stand and that water looms large in these concerns. I mean, um, if climate change kills us, if we have a shortage of water, if we have a shortage of resources, the question of whether somebody controls an extra 10 miles in a country we can't find on a map may not be the essential issue or whether we have just a, a simple question of whether we have our size is at Walmart the day we need it. Um, there's all these other larger questions and supply chain in almost everything is the central question of access, cost, productivity, relationship, it becomes the string by which many of these other questions become related. So why don't I stop there and open it up? And I've gone on too long and I apologize for that, but I've got another 10 pages that are that are there for discussion. So if you ever, yeah. um, anyway, that's where we are at the moment, Judy. We don't have 10 pages of questions, but we do have a number of questions. Uh, but I will say to the audience, uh, I believe that we also have room for a few more questions. So if you have a question for uh, Todd uh, at this point, please type it into the Q&A line and I will launch right in. First question, how do longshoremen factor into homeland security at ports? I, longshoremen, are important. Um, obviously, they there's there's a couple of levels, and a couple of levels start to be raised. One is the level of numbers, and you've had shortages of them because of pandemic on some ports, which have slowed down uh, everything from Charleston to uh, to LA to Long Beach. So numbers become one question. So you get questions that have relationship with pandemic. Secondly, is the question of often they've been controlled with family relationships and it's a very inclusive relationship where if your father worked there, you got into the longshoreman because some of the pay levels are incredibly high where you get 150 to you know, 200 and some thousand dollars per year you know, as, a, as an operator of a, of a loading system or something like that. Um, that becomes those, the question of access. Third, the idea about, about do you have the system, the infrastructure, which is there, which allow the longshoremen to work as quickly and efficiently as possible? The question of, of numbers of ships that can get in as opposed to sitting in a line in the ocean, the kind of unloading facilities that are there, the kind of movement ties to highways. Um, in LA, they build a special freeway just to basically get stuff out of the, you know, out of the loading area. All of those become factors. And so, it's the same thing where 
Um, a lot of this has become mechanized over the years, just as many other industries have within the United States. So what you're really talking about is the idea, not just longshoremen, you're talking um, about the role of people as opposed to machines. You're talking about the idea of what something's worth within a society. And you're talking about the fact that at this moment, we have a great need for the longshoremen, which gives them additional political and negotiating power that they didn't have previously. Okay, I'm gonna move on because uh, we do have a number of questions. We wanna get to as many as possible. But the next question I think is one that is in everybody's mind right now. Um, is there anything that can be done to affect Putin's calculus in continuing <laughs> the invasion, invasion of Ukraine? And I'm going to add a, a, a codicil to that of my own, which I also think is high in people's minds. Is Putin, in your you know, expert opinion, is he seriously contemplating the use of nuclear weapons you know, he put the nuclear force on high alert in response yeah. to some of the economic. Could you speak to the, the mind of Putin and the intentions of Putin? I, I don't know if anybody can speak to the mind of Putin. There's a number of theories about that at this moment. Number one is the fact that, that this is all part of a strategy that he, 15 years ago in 2007, he announced what he was going to do in terms of reaction, the feeling that the United States had basically um, punished Russia after the collapse, uh, both economically and politically of the Soviet Union. Um, one thing about the Russian mind and Putin is that you, they don't mind, you, you can hate a Russian, but you can't ignore them. A Russian wishes to be seen as, a, as the participant in a great society, and they are, as somebody who deserves to be at the table. And what you've got is a process where the economy doesn't rank them in that level. They're at the level of New York State or beneath the capacity of Spain or Italy. You know, in reality, their economy is in deep trouble and it's gonna be in far worse trouble because of the actions that are there. Uh, but they've got the greatest number of nuclear weapons in the world, um, roughly a couple hundred more than we do. You know, and so they can kill us just as we can kill them. But, you know, it's one of these um, Pyrrhus King of Epirus concepts where, you know, um, he won the battle, but all of his soldiers were killed. Yeah. So first question is, is in Putin's mind, he's logical. He's created this factor in his mind where the United States has basically pushed him around and pushed the Russians around and do don't realize. And so he's doing this as a national thing. There's a second theory that at the age of 69, he's turned toward his legacy and the reconstruction of what was theoretically a Soviet Union, especially Ukraine, which in his mind, he has decided doesn't exist as a nation. And even going back to the idea that Kiev and Rus, which I mean, Kiev was there before Russia, um, you know, that, that, that he's saving this. Third, okay. Putin in his mind truly believes that he is the guardian and that Russia is the guardian of all the values in the world. They believe in terms of gay rights and the role of women and the idea of freedom of choice, things like that, that basically in the role of the church, that basically the rest of the world is going to hell quickly in a handbasket. And then only Russia has that. Now, next, fourth, there's a serious question. For the last year, Putin has spent practically full time at the dacha, the summer house, because of COVID and because he's afraid somebody will infect him. So he has roughly four people that have access to him regularly, most of whom, um, and supposedly there's a split. Three have basically argued against, though not violently, against the idea of, of taking military action. One that had the greatest impact, who's the dumbest out of the four. Um, and that's probably the kindest way of putting it. Um, had convinced him that they could do this. And this was a one day operation or two days at most. And which is why they never figured out they needed, they needed a supply chain. Yeah. They have all, they have the, the trucks there without additional fuel. They have, they have the soldiers there without food. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought they were going to be there that long. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they're coming in from three angles as opposed to one. So they didn't think about it. And Putin basically didn't open himself up. He's blocked out every other opposition where Navalny's in jail and they shut down uh, Echo Moscow and they shut down Dost, 
which is rain, um, the name Dorsht means rain, um, which were the two independent channels in Russia. Dorsht, <coughs> there's a great, great scene today on the internet <coughs> where the writers for Dorsht all resigned in protest. And so they're showing them in the office and they're all walking out. And when a crisis happens in Russia, um, the TV channels just stop and they play Tchaikovsky. <laughs> so when you hear Tchaikovsky in Russia, you knew there's a crisis. We, my wife and I sat in Sochi for three days listening to Tchaikovsky and playing, playing gin rummy because we couldn't get on planes and you had no concept of whether the country had ended or, or what had happened. And, um, and so they ended the Dost walk out of their office playing Tchaikovsky, you know, to show there was a crisis. So there's a, there's a theory now that Putin's mind has been affected by all this. And now that, now that leads to the next question in terms of what impact can you have? If he truly has had um, a change both in attitude and in terms of strategy, um, does he, is there a rational process going through, which for years, the concept of mad mutually assured destruction and the idea of nuclear destruction on both sides was our greatest asset. Right now, if that's out, out of his mind and the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which means you can only blow up a small city or a middle, middle sized city, but not have to kill everybody else, you know, is that a, a possibility for him? Because if he feels that he's losing, if yeah. he's feeling the animals are most dangerous when they believe they're cornered. There's a theory in psychology that talks about the idea that a person who's suffering from paranoia or schizophrenia, if you put them into a room, they start to believe that their personality and essence of their body controls the, is around the whole room. So somebody walking in even to a large room is in fact invading and threatening them. Yeah. And what I think is that you're at that point where if he thinks he had to go on TV today to talk about the idea that we're doing well, you know, and, and they've done a low number for the number of people killed. And if, if TV, if the Russians announced 500 were killed, that means it's probably over a thousand, yeah. you know, yeah. and the Russians, the Russian explanation to this, which shifted today, um, before it was the idea that we're, you're stopping the, the Ukrainians from getting nuclear weapons. The explanation, explanation from the Kremlin today was the idea that, that the Ukrainians attacked Russia and yeah. so our soldiers are dying yeah. basically to fight back against the Ukrainian attack. And, and, so, and remember, 90% of people get their information from the state, state channels. Yeah. So um, We have uh, about 15 minutes left and we have about 20 questions. So oh, oh. I'm going to try and go as fast as possible. Um, would you care to make a very brief, very brief uh, prognostication? What is going to happen in Ukraine? Well, um, no one's ever accused me of doing anything briefly. Uh, <laughs> so, number one, Putin will win short-term victories. Number two, Putin's nobody's going to win this war. If anybody yeah. wins, it's going to be um, it's going to be Zelensky and the Ukrainians, God willing. Um, and I don't want to see anybody killed. I mean, I don't. I, that's not a good thing. But <clears throat> Russia is going to suffer for years. It's going to be a pariah. Putin will be a pariah. And unless they get rid of him relatively rapidly, the Russians are going to suffer in terms of trade and economic development. Um, and even the, even the oligarchs who are the richest are going to you know, suffer in many ways. So the short term is going to be tough. The long term and the development and redevelopment of, of relationships, I think, are going to take a long time. And I, and I say that with no joy as somebody who, who lives there and has family and, and friend, my best friends are there. And my okay. wife's Russian and she speaks to her friends every day, so. Yeah, okay, moving on, uh, some questions about uh, supply chains. Uh, in the US, this questioner says, we relied on our profit-based healthcare system for, to prepare for a pandemic, but it wasn't profitable. And so it didn't work. How can capitalism address these and other global problems with regard to supply chains? You know, two aspects. One is the idea, somebody once said, um, 
um, Christianity has not worked. It, is, it has never been attempted. And they said the same thing about capitalism too, that pure capitalism never really you know, existed. So I think you're gonna have to have a serious national conversation about what do we have to do in terms of both equality and production in terms of reinvestment in education and the idea of, of certain areas that, that, are the, that are the future. That's number one. Now, number two, I think that, that we have to start identifying what the core issues are, which is the idea that, that, that capitalism has benefited many in terms of level of, uh, level of life. Um, and, but it's changed our expectation of, and part of this is the question of expectation. Do you need more? What is, you know, what is a happy life, which are more and more people are talking about, you know, if, <clears throat> if um, you've got pandemic, but, and, but your money, uh, but your money is um, there, is that really a better life if you can't travel and don't have access to things? Those are issues that Americans often don't discuss. And Judy, that's a, that's a hard question because quite frankly, um, we've had this question about for, year, for hundreds of years about, about what does capitalism, and it's becoming more, a greater issue now, does capitalism have an impact which basically is divisive in the long run? That basically the powerful get more powerful and the less powerful basically lose power. And the answer appears to be yes, unless there's a governmental activity to control it. Now, the level of that differs in terms of taxation and governmental structure, which frankly, I, and I, there's no set portion that 47% is the right level. We have to find a golden mean and we don't know how to do it yet. Um, we have a number of questions in the file here. Uh, people who would like uh, to share your uh, your slide deck. Uh, is that a possibility? Would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? Do they, if, are, they, are they pure of heart? <laughs> yes. Of course, we the don't answer, allow to register. The answer is yes. You know, the answer is yes. I, I always would say um, in Russia, the first question is, uh, yes, Dusha, which is, do you have a soul? And, um, and so, the, listen, um, whatever I have or whatever I can do. I, I have an article which was just published two weeks ago in the Russian Historical Review, which is their academic journal on the geopolitical relationships between, between uh, Russia, China, and the United States and what this means for the future. And <clears throat> if anybody's interested in that, I can send it to Judy and she can distribute it to the list or whatever. And I will doing. say uh, to everyone watching, if you are interested in the overhead, uh, the PowerPoint, uh, uh, power the deck, um, just get in touch with me. I'll put my, for those of you who don't have my email address, I'll put it in the chat line um, and uh, ask me what you want. Maybe you want a, a preprint of, of Todd's article, is it? I'll be glad to send that out, but just get in touch with me. And, listen, okay. and, if, you, and if you can't sleep at night, <clears throat> the article is a fantastic sedative. Okay. <laughs> All right, next question. We have a lot of questions actually about what is the role of China in all this? How does this present conflict, how does this, you know, the, the China and, and Russia are growing <clears throat> closer? What is the, you know, who's going to benefit here in uh, terms of China? You've got, you've got three, the world? three relationships yeah. that are here. One is, is that China has built a closer relationship between Xi Jinping and Putin. Now, um, China just to finished by probably doubling their amount of uh, natural gas. So they're bringing in their build, they're building the power of Siberia too from the Yamal Prince uh, Peninsula up in the north of China. So the Chinese have increased their purchases of Chinese of Russian military and oil and gas. Now within 10 years, probably eight years, probably the way it's going now, the, Ch the Chinese will, will um, reverse engineer practically every military weapon from Russia and will stop buying that because they won't need them. Secondly, this increases their dependence uh, and their relationship with oil and gas, which means that they're able to better negotiate pricing because the Europe will be cut off as, as a market. So the Chinese are put in better position for, for getting a lower price on this. Secondly, is as I mentioned, if Ukraine had gone really quickly, I think you would have seen actions, especially with the, the idea of the United States doing nothing. 
I think you would have seen an, uh, almost an immediate invasion of, ta of uh, Taiwan there. Third is the idea of China's trying to figure out how to play a middle role because they need the markets of the United States and the West. And they can't go too far you know, in terms of support of Russia. So what they're doing is they abstained at the United Nations in terms of the vote condemning Russia. And secondly, is that the, one of the Chinese national banks decided they would not totally work with the Russians in terms of um, as an alternative finance system. So the Chinese are, are, are somewhat confused at the moment, trying to figure out how, they, how they're gonna handle this. The, China, the Russians see themselves as equal partners. The Chinese see the Russians as a one trick pony and the one trick is oil and gas. And eventually what's gonna happen is Russia will become less and less of an important partner in that relationship. Those, those are the factors with China. Okay. All right, the next question is kind of a devil's advocate question. Um, this question, uh, my grandfather emigrated from uh, one of the cities that's currently under attack yeah. in the Ukraine in a, about 1907. Um, he never called himself Ukrainian. He spoke Russian. He said he came from Russia to the end of his life. He said he was of Russian you know, background. Oh. Is there any justification for the Russian view that the Ukraine is an integral part of the Russian nation? Or is it a paranoid fantasy? Um, <clears throat> as um, I don't know who, who asked the question. I know that my grandparents came from that section um, when you were, um, but being Jewish, we got tired of having the Cossacks kill us. And so we were literally from that section. And I used to say to people that we were Russian, Ukrainian, or, or Romanian, depending upon the year that you're asking, because quite frankly, they changed historically. Secondly, is the question that, that um, when you're paranoid, everything's logical. You know, and I, I asked one of my friends once in Russia, I said, is paranoia here considered an art or a science? <laughs> and my humor was not, was not totally appreciated at that point. So the answer is, is that there's a historical relationship if you're looking at a broader sense of, of the Kiev and Rus going back and being part, that, that the Ukraine basically got Crimea because, um, because the Moscow always assumed they controlled the Ukraine. They weren't giving it away, they were giving it themselves, you know, and so, you know, um, you know, when he when he gave it away, supposedly one night drunk, but, um, you know, that he didn't think it was a great deal, you know, a great big thing. So the Russians have this view. And right now, they've got, there's a tremendous motion there. There's an old saying um, that though uh, that basically the people that can those who control the past control the future. Orwell said that many years ago. What they're doing is there's a big thing on rewriting history in Russia, just as there is with the thing in the United States with rewriting history yeah. and showing, trying to show that they had this interrelationship. Plus, there's this concept of Russia of the Slavic Brotherhood uh, that were tied to our Slavic brothers. And they don't really, and plus, you've got Ukrainians being the third largest ethnic group in Russia. You've got this, the incredible amount of intermarriage and interrelationships, a number of the Russian leaders whose families come from Ukraine. So there's a special tie there. And so they built justifications. Plus a lot of people really believed, you know, a lot of people did speak both Ukrainian and Russian, especially in the East of the country. So um, yes, some of it's mythic and some of it is a, is, is a sense that they've had so many ties for so many years it was never questioned until now. Okay, um, a number of questioners are asking, um, basically, for you know, what can we do? What what three uh, uh, possible uh, courses could we take? What what three um, you know what three things could we do to address some of the problems that you have raised? Are you talking about Ukraine or are you talking about- I think more society? in general uh, with the uh, supply chain and, and global uh, right. interdependence. <clears throat> Number one, become involved in groups that are raising broader issues and not just tied to one sector. There's a number of institutions in society. Um, 
uh, you know, whether they're, they're think tanks or the idea about, about larger groups like Global Minnesota or, you know, some of the group's great decisions or things like that. Secondly is the idea, and this is not, not in any special order. Secondly is the idea about, about we need to read things that knowledge, intelligence is a concept of relationships and understanding what relationships mean that you're not just doing something separately. It's not just basically a, a, um, a vertical process here, but it's horizontal, where you basically, everything you do has impact upon, uh, upon something else. So reading things like the Financial Times, which I think is the best newspaper in the world, or The Economist, or there's a number of websites that are, that are truly good. Um, Carnegie in Moscow and, and, and Russia is unbelievably fair. Um, and people like Dmitry Trenin have been, have been good analysts. Um, so the question of what you read. Secondly, is that um, <clears throat> support those candidates and ask the questions of things like education. Everybody gives you the simple thing. Nobody's against education. They just don't vote for it. And so hold people accountable. I'm, I'm a Democrat, and I'm, uh, uh, though I'm not sure I'm happy with anybody at this moment. You know, I'm, I, I don't like anybody practically. I mean, that, you know, that because often they have not the courage to ask the right questions. And um, so find people, even if it's third parties that basically support and ask the, the broader questions in society, they may not be successful, but, but ideas have a channel like this where it takes a long time for it to develop as a concept until people start seeing it as part of a basic essence of a society. Third is the idea about, about I think the, the question is, is that use the technology that we have to us. It's really hard. I'm, I'm 81 years old, and it's hard for me to learn some of the new technologies. My grandchildren, <clears throat> if it's a serious question, I ask my wife, and if it's a truly serious question, I call my grandchildren, and they tell me what to do. Um, but learn how to use it so that you can express your opinions. There's too many people that are filled with hatred and anger that basically have control of the internet or control of letters to the editor or something like that. Basically everybody, I know a number of people in this that are in this discussion and you, you're really good minds. And, you know, basically express yourself. You know, that's, that's what's happened is a lot of us because of Minnesota nice have gone silent and we just have withdrawn. We've, we've trapped ourselves in Netflix, you know, and we don't, you know, but there's a conflict going on now for control of the American mind. And sometimes we've ceded that to the forces of evil. And so stand up, you know, and do it because your voice is as good in a lot of cases better than anybody else, and especially most of the voices that are being heard now. Okay, I think we're, we're almost out of time, but I'm gonna put in one last question here. This questioner wants to know, you've criticized a lot of things. There's a lot of things we're doing right or wrong. What is one thing that we're doing right as a nation with regard to these issues? I think, you know, I, um, I was giving a talk up in Grand Rapids or something in place and I was giving a talk on international economics and a woman raised her hand and she said, I just have one question. She says, um, is there anything good going on in the world? And I broke out laughing and so did she, thank God. Um, you know, what's happened is yes, the fact that brought, that a number of people are beginning to discuss what the issues are, whether it's infrastructure or the idea of, of basic issues or the role of the United States in the world or where we fit, or what the changes are. And as I mentioned, ideas have a growth pattern like this. <clears throat> where a concept may be there for years before people start to think about what does it mean. And we're at the point now, and this is not an even process, it's uneven, staggered, of where people are in terms of thinking through issues. Think issues like, like debt, like pensions. What does it mean to retire? What is the role and function of those of us that theoretically people consider too old to fit into anywhere else? And we're still alive. And by God, you know, I think there's a tremendous ageism in this society, which I never noticed when I was young. But the fact is, we're talking about those things, which is that the initial point, part of it's the question of what do we do? Because there are legitimate differences in what our choices are and where we put our money. And you've got so many people that have become individually focused upon their segment of the society or where they're interested, what their interest is. They don't see the fact 
that it's the relationship between all these different factors together that make a better society. You know, and so that's what we're doing right. Okay. And we're on the right path, but it's slow. It's slow and it's frustrating. And, and some I'm days sorry, but we're going to have to end it on that note. I, it is frustrating, I, I admit. Uh, for everyone uh, who is uh, interested in getting uh, copies of Todd's slides, that is possible. Please email me. I put my email uh, address a couple of times in the chat line. Uh, also, keep in mind that this talk has been recorded. If you want to revisit the talk, pick up something maybe the second time you didn't get the first time. The talk will be posted to our website um, within a few days. Thank you so much, uh, Todd Lefko. Thank you to the, the back uh, of the building uh, crew, uh, uh, you know, um, Grayson, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience and my deep apologies for all the questions that I didn't get to. They were all excellent. I wanna talk about next time. This is the last of the 2021 Great Decisions talks. We will start the 2022 Great Decisions series next month, April 8th. You are all registered uh, through the library anyway. Those of you who signed up through the library are already registered for the series beginning on April 8th. You do not need to do anything unless uh, you want to get the briefing book, and there will be copies of that available at the library and also available for purchase through uh, Global Minnesota. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. <laughs>